But if you have a widespread failure, where there's all these claims for base dollars that vastly exceed the number of base dollars, and uh, instead banks have a lot of exposure to risky, illiquid loans that are either unable to be moved around easily uh, and converted back into cash, or if they are at risk of defaulting and therefore losing a portion of customer deposits. Uh, and so what, what they did back in 2008, in part, was that they created a ton of new base money and they said, well, we're going to create a ton of new base money. We're going to buy some of those assets to reliquify the system. And so, it, I mean, it's not a, it's not an exaggeration to say it's essentially like a Ponzi scheme. It's just wow. something that has to keep going in order and keep growing in order to function. Respected financial analyst Lynn Alden specializes in macroeconomic trends, investing in finance, and is also a researcher and writer in this field. Lynn discusses the banking system, in particular the fractional reserve method that banks utilize to produce new money, in this video. In accordance with this method, banks only hold a portion of their deposits in reserve and lend the remainder. Since the system depends on an ever-increasing supply of debt to keep the economy thriving, the technique of producing money out of thin air is comparable to a Ponzi scheme. She adds that banks' excessive loan creation causes asset bubbles, inflation, and financial instability. She discusses the settlement of Bitcoin and how, with widespread adoption, its quick network and scalability will put banks out of business. She continued by discussing central banks and the differences between them when it comes to the danger that private banks face, such as the seldom incidence of bank runs. And basically, it's it's one of the cheapest source of funding available. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's a key thing that a bank does, is that they're able to borrow interest very, very low, um, and then they're able to lend it out at, at higher interest rates and collect that. And there's obviously, there's very different types of banks. There are investment banks, there are commercial banks. Some banks are very simple, some are very complex. But at the end of the day, what their primary purpose is, is they're, you know, they're providing checking services, they're providing saving services, they're, you know, they're, they're, uh, providing services, but at the end of the day, those are, uh, you know, a liability for them, an asset for us, and so they're borrowing money. It's actually insurance companies kind of do the same thing. You know, they collect premiums, they pay out claims, but in the middle, they're they're holding this big float, and they can generate, you know, they can invest that float, they can collect income on their investments by holding things like bonds, and then therefore that that's that's what represents income for an insurance company, and you essentially see the same thing with a bank. Basically, the, most of the modern financial system that we build up over a long period of time is this kind of arbitrage where banks are arbitraging the fact that you know they have a bunch of depositors that are coming and going, but in aggregate, most of their total assets, I mean, to their total liabilities are not changing very frequently, and so they have this they have this kind of permanent low cost source of borrowing that they can can lend out for longer periods of time in slightly higher risk uh, capacities. And by having diversification, by having sufficient liquidity on hand to withhandle to, to you know with, with handle withdrawals, most of the time they're fine and they generate that income and then they you know they pay themselves, they pay their shareholders. Uh, it's basically a, a big middleman operation. And that that's how things work. And obviously, you know, back a long time ago, this was a really valuable service because you know, if you're talking about like say depositing gold coins at a bank and getting like a banknote for them, you know, you're speeding up, you're you're getting better divisibility, you're getting all these services. Even today, many of us use banks because we're getting something from the relationship. We're we're able to, you know, connect into this big global set of ledgers, move money around, not have to store a bunch of physical cash like in our home. Obviously, there are some recent alternatives that we can use, like say Bitcoin, for example. But prior to Bitcoin, this is kind of the best we have, uh, and so that that's the world we live in. I think when you have the underlying settlement asset move move as quickly as something like Bitcoin does, it, either fractional reserve banking doesn't make sense, or the ratios that that are workable are so much lower than the current ratios we have now that you can get up to like say twenty three to one, for example. That type of ratio completely goes away when the underlying settlement asset can move very quickly and you don't really get any advantages um, other than yield for having it in one of those. So, so for example, back in you know, the, the free banking days, besides yield, the advantage you got for putting your, your, your gold in a bank is one, you didn't have to, you didn't have to worry about cussing it anymore. Uh, and two, you, you're now tied into this telecommunicate telecommunications connected ledger system and you can move claims around faster so you basically you put it in you get you know higher velocity from it um, but in an, in a world where 
it is safer to uh, you know secure the underlying. Let's say, for example, Bitcoin multisig. You don't you only have to worry about storing mass amounts of gold in your home. And two, if the underlying moves just as fast as bank ledgers do, um, then there's there's less of a reason uh, to ever put it at risk in any sort of fractional reserve way, or at least any significant fractional reserve way. Um, and so I think that's that's the yeah that's the changeover. Let's say the monetary base was gold, and these were all claimed for gold, and you had five times as many claims for gold. Then the answer was, uh, you know, some of those claims would not be met. Those would be you know defaulted on, and people you know thought they had deposits, but they were fractionally reserved, and they're you know some of them are gone now. In the current system, because the monetary base is flexible. It's basically just it's it's a bank it's a central bank ledger. Instead, what generally happens is if if the system starts to collapse, starts to freeze up like it did in 2008, they instead rapidly increase the monetary base, and so you you instead kind of spread it out via inflation and currency dilution rather than defaults. Um, and so that that's kind of the current era that we're in. And one way that, that you can, when you zoom out, it kind of goes back to that thing. Like if if a product is free, I mean you're not you're not the customer. You're 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 the product yeah. for someone else being a customer. And so for example, if, if you're you know there are custodians out there, right? If you're for example an ETF is in many ways a custodian. They're holding a bunch of stocks, for example. And they, they're a wrapper around stocks and they charge a very low you know, expense ratio to hold those stocks or if they're an active ETF to choose which stocks to hold. But even if it's just a passive ETF, they're just following an index, they're basically holding the stocks for you. They're administering the details and charging a small fee for it. And that's a, that's a custodian of relationship. Same thing if you if you have gold in a vault somewhere, normally you're paying a very small fee in order to maintain that because you know they're not lending your gold out. Uh, you know their their income comes from you as the customer. Whereas if you are if you're not really paying much, or even if you're getting paid, then you're essentially the product. Uh, you're you know in this case you're providing a low interest rate loan to them and the, the relationship we have with the banks is a little bit of both because in some ways we do we do pay fees you know we might pay fee for a wire transfer or something like that but we also you know earn earn interest or at least we used to and now we kind of do around the margins uh, because we're we're the ones providing uh, that that low cost loan to them and this, this is the system we've, we've been in for quite a while I generally separate beneficial and harmful as that's one axis versus inevitable or not inevitable. So I, I think I think kind of the way I put it is that it's inevitably going to happen, at least with the, with the current and the prior level of technology that we had for the past couple centuries. That is essentially anytime you have a custodial service, like, you know, you're, you're depositing your gold, you're getting claims for that gold at a future date, those people inevitably realize, wait a second, you know, most people don't come and, and take the gold out at the same time and therefore uh, I can use this and then you start to get market pressures like you know all the all these different custodians are holding your gold and they're all charging fees and then someone says wait a second if I if I lend 20% of this out I can generate some in income from that and then I can charge my customers no fees and they all want to use my service instead of my competitors and if they don't disclose that to customers it's fraud uh, but if they do disclose that customers, customers might say, well, I mean, if you're loaning out 20% of it, that sounds reasonable. If they're, you know, secure lending practices and so forth, it's 80% backed by gold, is 20% backed by, you know, uh, you know, less liquid loans. Sure, I'll, I'll take that trade off. Um, and then another one might come along and say, we're, we're going to lend out 40% of it. And not only are we going to make the custodian free, we're going to then pay you a little bit as profit sharing. Right. And, mm. and so there's kind of I think it's one of those things where if you have a mismatch in speed between the claims and the underlying. Right. So gold is slow and, and you know, bank accounts are quick. You're going to get that arbitrage and banks are going to make use of that arbitrage. That's why once fractional reserve banking was a thing, it spread everywhere. Uh, and so I think it's one of those things where it's inevitable in that current era of technology. Uh, basically, market forces are going to keep pushing in that direction. It's going it, to, whenever they push it too far, it's going to blow up. And so, it's less that I view it as good or bad; is that I view it as inevitable. Now, I think there there are ways. You know, I think, you know, if, if you had a bare asset that could settle quickly, there's less of a reason to fractionally reserve it. And uh, basically, whenever it attempts to be fractionally reserved, it's much more likely to break. 
is you know because people can pull it out quicker there's less of a reason to put up with that risk right so i think that in a, basically as technology changes over time with with bitcoin for example i i think that that can squeeze out the need for it uh-huh. but i think it's it's basically inevitable over the past number of centuries that, it, that it's going to be there they're at the heart of the system whereas uh you know major banks are the layer up so uh you have a, an account with a bank um they do all they provide services for you and they have assets that back up those deposits and some of those assets are stored at the central bank which are liability for the central bank which are then backed up by things like government bonds or other assets on the on the central bank balance sheet so that's the main difference is that you know rather than a free banking system where every bank you know has its own underlying assets like gold for example and has claims to them instead most systems around the world are are now central banking which is that they're all connected to the central bank ledger uh, so that's the one difference is just the layer and then the second difference is really about you know what happens if they go insolvent right so for example if a normal bank goes insolvent i mean assuming it doesn't get a bailout um then it's at risk of you know uh basically some sort of liquidation forced buyout some sort of uh, thing like that they have to be basically reconstructed um whereas a central bank technically can survive with negative equity um and, and so they they don't really have risk of bankruptcy in the same way that a normal bank does they have different laws that govern their accounting um and they have just overall different constraints a bank run can happen in a couple of different ways. A normal bank, the reason a normal bank run can happen uh, is, you know, you don't trust that bank. You're worried they're going to go bankrupt. They're not going to pay you back. So you pull your money out and you have two choices to do with that money. You can either hold it in cash um, or you can then you or you can shift it to another bank. You know, let's say you, you're worried about bank X, you want, and, but you think bank Y is safe. And so you pull it out to, to bank Y. Um, a, a central bank's a little bit different in one, there's there's no alternative, at least within that country's currency system, right? So there's, there's no competitor central bank that they're gonna rush to. Um, now, if you, look, if you look at international situations, that's different. But for example, you know, there, there's no world where Bank of America, for example, wants to pull out of the Federal Reserve because what are they going to do with it, right? There's no other There's no other thing to put it in. Number two is the central bank controls how much physical currency that there even is. Uh, and so they, they have two sides of their monetary base, which is bank reserves and physical currency. And, you know, you can get a situation. I mean, if enough people want to do bank runs um, or, you know, if you have something like that, there's, there's only so much physical currency out there that they can even pull into. And so if enough people try to do bank runs, you'd actually get told no, even if the bank wasn't bankrupt. Like even if it wasn't insolvent, they would just say there's literally a cash shortage um, and we can't meet that demand for, for you know, for, for your claims being pulled out. Um, and the central bank is what determines, you know, every year, for example, a Federal Reserve tells the, you know, the Bureau of, of Engraving and Printing how much physical currency they want to order uh, to determine basically what percentage of their monetary base they want to be in that physical form. So they, by, by basically controlling the parameters of what you can even withdraw from, uh, they can avoid any sort of bank run scenario. Now they have other they have other risks or downsides from having negative equity, uh, and there's other risks that uh, that they can run into. But a bank run isn't really one of them. What are your thoughts on the financial system? Post your comments below and let us know what you think. Also, don't forget to switch on post alerts, leave us a like, and subscribe. Many thanks for tuning in.